So my message this morning that I felt God laid on me is entitled, Our Only Hope. And I think a lot of us can relate to this slide. Hold on, pain ends. And the only thing that used to keep me going, I think a lot of you know some of my story, from the time I was a little, little boy, the only thing that kept me going is I had a little, a little saying I would say to myself, and that was, the hope that tomorrow would be different. And I felt like, and I, I think many can relate, I felt like I was hanging on by a thread. And I think a lot of what people are going through right now, there's a lot of people hanging on by a thread. And I think more than any time in this world's history right now, at least in my lifetime, we need hope. And I think as God's people, we need to focus on the only source of hope. And I love this scripture that was always a favorite of mine. And I think why I love it so much is I would have called myself a prisoner of hopelessness. But because of Jesus, we can all become prisoners of hope. And I capitalize stronghold here because the stronghold is Jesus, Amen. the only stronghold. And I love this scripture in Luke 4, 17 to 18. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And having unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed. His whole ministry was a ministry of reconciliation. Jesus told us, here on this earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And it's only as Christ is in us, the hope of glory, that we too are overcomers. Well, we overcome because we are in Christ. So that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave his life for me. I don't know that we really contemplate that reality, and I think we need to each day, because it is that reality of what Jesus did that can actually transform our lives. It's only as we abide in Christ, it's only as we partake of Christ, it's only as we identify with his life, death and resurrection that we are going to survive the slings and arrows that are hurled at us by his enemy and our enemy. And that enemy is called the God of this world. Jesus declared in John 14, 30, I cannot talk with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. And then... In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, they do not believe because their minds have been kept in the dark by the evil God of this world. He keeps them from seeing the light shining on them, the light that comes from the good news about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. The huge dragon was thrown out that ancient serpent named the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and all his angels. He was thrown down because he could not find anyone else that would listen to his lies about God's law of love and his government. 
He had brought so many accusations against our loving Jesus. And this is a sobering verse in Revelation 12. And so be glad, you heavens, and all that live there. But how terrible for the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, and he is filled with rage because he knows he only has a little time left. Praise God, he only has a little time left. As a result of what we've just read, you know that we have an enemy that he's prowling around like a roaring lion, like the scriptures say, seeking whom he may devour. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. I remember a number of years ago, I was attending a church in California. I was a brand new Christian. And the speaker, just at the end of church, he invited us to stand by or come later on in the afternoon to listen to a series on what the blueprints of Satan are. And I remember thinking, why on earth would I want to know about the blueprints of Satan? Why? And yet we're living in a day where we're bombarded. We're bombarded with information that is meant from our enemy to pull us down and discourage us. We need to focus on what God is doing, not his enemy. This speaks very well of the day in which we live. Luke 21, 26, people will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Every age throughout history has been fraught with its trials and sorrows in this soon-to-end conflict with the forces of darkness. And our present day is no exception. How can we have hope when the world is in such chaos? Well, I think we can go to Matthew 14, 22 and glean some insights. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the lake while he sent the people away. After sending the people away, he went up a hill by himself to pray. When evening came, Jesus was there alone. And by this time, the boat was far out in the lake, tossed about by the waves because the wind was blowing against it. Between three and six o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water. When they saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and screamed with fear. Jesus spoke to them at once. Courage, he said, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then Peter spoke up. Lord, if it is really you, order me to come out on the water to you. Come, answered Jesus. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water to Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he was afraid and started to sink down in the water. Save me, Lord, he cried. Immediately when he cried, Jesus was there to grab him. At once, Jesus reached out and grabbed hold of him and said, what little faith you have, why do you doubt? They both got into the boat and the wind died down immediately as soon as Jesus stepped into the boat. And I think the lesson we can learn from this story is when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he started sinking. He was in the midst of a tempest, howling winds, raging waters. Does that sound anything like the world we live in? Doesn't it feel sometimes like we're in a tempest? So I would advise us all to acquaint ourselves with our lovely Jesus, focus on his promises, focus on his power. We serve an amazing, powerful God, a God who can walk on water. There's nothing he can't do. 
but he's also always watching over us. Notice how Jesus came out, walking on the water, if you will, to check in on his disciples, to make sure they were all right. So the only way for us to not be sucked into the vortex of the tempest is to keep our eyes on Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. This is the ministry that God has given us. This is the work to make friends for Christ. 1 John 4.19, we love him because he first loved us. So what is it that changes us from enemies to friends? I believe it's the cross. I believe when we behold our Savior and his sufferings and realize that he didn't just do it for the world. We all think of the scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we need to insert our own names into that replace world with your name because God so loved you that he would have come and died if it had just been you that had gone astray the cross is the divine masterpiece of reconciliation it obliterates all accusations that Satan had brought against God's character, against his law of love. He had accused God, his law of being faulty and arbitrary. He accused God of being self-serving, uncaring, and untrustworthy. The cross is just a dim picture to our dull senses of the pain and suffering that didn't just begin or end at Calvary. It began at the very beginning of sin because the heart of God ached for his children that were hurting, that he was losing. And that pain continues still. It's only as we behold his love that we're changed Everything that's out of harmony or contrary to his law of love within us will, as we continue to behold him, fall away of itself naturally. We behold by spending time each day and learning about Jesus and the things he did. His life is a life worth emulating, and he wants us to come into a close, intimate connection with him. The scriptures tell us he loves us and knows us so intimately that he numbers the hairs on our heads. For some of us, he doesn't have to do as much when it comes to that. But I love John 15, 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. And I would say we can do nothing of eternal significance without him. And the fruits that will be manifest in the lives of those who follow his teachings and love him are found in Galatians 5.22. And I think these are pretty desirable characteristics, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. I love this parable in Matthew 7, 24 to 27. So then anyone who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain poured down, the rivers flooded over, and the wind blew hard against that house. But it did not fall because it was built on rock. 
But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not obey them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain poured down and the rivers flooded over. The wind blew hard against that house and it fell. And what a terrible fall it was. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. I don't want to build my hopes on something that is temporal, on something that is ethereal, on something that is unpredictable, like the shifting sands. I want to build my house and my faith on a rock. Amen. So in these uncertain times, wouldn't it be advisable to do just that, to build our faith, our trust, our hope on Christ? Because he wants to help us and he will never fail or leave us. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. That's Hebrews 13, verse 5. And that rock is described in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, the rock that that house was built upon. And all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Well, we live in a secular world, just as the time this scripture was written. Some trust in chariots and others in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. I would say perhaps if you were to translate this for today, it might be some trust in politics or the power and strength of the military. I don't want to build my trust in things that are so temporary. Jesus came to give us rock solid hope. And I choose to put my trust in him. And I love that he described himself to the people who were inspired to write the Bible. He described himself as the comforter. I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, the spirit of truth, who will always be with you. John 14, 16 to 17. And I love this. From Isaiah 61, verse 3, Jesus came to console those who mourn, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Notice those last two sentences, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. In Galatians 3, verse 11, it says, Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. So I was kind of curious to unpack what that meant in the original Greek word, so I looked it up. And what the original Greek word that was used there, I'll probably make a mess of uh, pronouncing it, but I, it might be pistis. But that's the original Greek word, and when I looked it up, I loved what it meant. It means total reliance upon Christ for salvation. And of course, salvation is healing. God wants to heal us from the damage that sin has done to us. So perhaps a more accurate translation of this verse might be, the just shall live by total reliance upon Christ for salvation. I like that. So there it is. The only way any of us will ever be saved or healed from all the damage that sin has done to us is to exercise that faith, that total reliance upon Christ for salvation. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift 
so that no one can boast. The religious leaders in Christ's time had grossly misunderstood and misrepresented the character of God to all the people that they were supposed to be ministering to, and they went about trying to earn their own way to heaven by fabricating a man-made righteousness. So I have two versions of Romans 10, 3. The first one is from the King James Version. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. I love how this one was put in the Good News Bible. They have not known the way in which God puts people right with himself. And instead, they have tried to set up their own way, so they did not submit themselves to God's way of putting people right. I believe the only way that God can set and keep us right and put our feet on the path that leads to healing and leads to him and to our eternal home, the only way he could do it was making himself relatable and familiar to us. So it was only as we learned about him and experienced him that we could actually get it. If you know what I mean, sometimes I'm a little slow in getting it. Yet the scriptures declare in Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. The good news is that he alone can save us. It's all his doing because we cannot save ourselves. Jude 1, 24, I just love this. What a beautiful promise. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Notice who does it, because we can't do it. I'm a father and I wish I could save my children, but I'm like, well, wait a minute, I can't save myself, so where do I get off thinking I can save my children? But there's a beautiful promise that I love. It's Isaiah 49, 25. I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. And I believe you can take that promise to the bank. And Jesus promised, he said in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, all people. John 6, 37, everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will never drive away. That's good news. And I love this beautiful promise. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. No matter what the future holds, we need to remember that he holds the future in his hands. And he's promised us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promises. And he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time that you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. He is the God of the impossible. And I'm living proof because, man, if you would have known who I was before, but I think there's a number of us in here who can relate to that. Jeremiah 32, 17, O Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. We need to remember that. We need to remember not only all the miracles of the past that he performed for his people, but we need to remember all the miracles that he perform, has performed for us. As a matter of fact, the end of the book of Malachi, it tells us that God has a book of remembrance. 
And I would suggest us all to keep a book of remembrance. And in that book of remembrance, I would suggest journaling the times where God has showed up in your life, the times where God has answered prayer, the times where God has met with you and blessed you. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the miracles he did then, he can do now. And this was just after the Hebrew slaves finally had escaped 400 years of bondage in Egypt. They came to a place where there was no way out. All they had before them was the Red Sea. Exodus 14, starting at verse 21 to 22. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind that turned it into dry land. So the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with walls of water on their right and on their left. Imagine what an amazing experience that would have been. They walked on dry land, and that dry land through the sea had to accommodate millions of men, women, and children. I can imagine perhaps if the moonlight was shining through or the sunlight was shining through and they would see all the fish. Wouldn't that be exciting? <laughs> or scary? So here's another wonderful miracle that I love to recount to you today. This was when there was a great army that had come against Judah. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, we find it beginning at verse 15. Early the next morning, Elijah's servant got up, went out of the house, and saw the Syrian troops with their horses and chariots surrounding the town. He went back to Elijah and exclaimed, We are doomed, sir. What shall we do? Don't be afraid, Elijah answered. We have more on our side than they have on theirs. Then he prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord answered his prayer, and Elijah's servant looked up and saw the hillside covered with horses and chariots of fire all around. So perhaps if we had eyes to see, we would see the same thing, especially when we're facing trials and difficulties. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle does not belong to you, but to God. So that is something we need to take to heart. Do not be afraid or discouraged. The battle does not belong to you, but to God. So even though our God is a king capable of doing anything, we need to remember that he came to this world as a baby, a defenseless baby, lying in a feed trough in a barn. Though he's the creator, he's also called the great shepherd. And how fitting that that is his name. Because the Bible States in Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. I know where that got me when I went off wandering in my own paths. It was not a pretty picture. So Jesus went a little step further than what an earthly shepherd would do. Earthly shepherds are there to protect and to watch over the flock, to bind up their wounds. Well, our shepherd went a step farther, and he laid down his life to rescue us. Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And I think that's why the blood of Jesus was the full, absolute demonstration of his total love for us, that he was willing to empty himself completely, even of his own blood, as a declaration of his love. 
And it was that declaration, thankfully, that forever sealed the fate of his enemy. And it laid to rest once and for all, all of the lies that the enemy had lodged against him. So this scripture in Matthew 9, 11 to 12, really this version was quite amazing. The New Living Version, I couldn't get over it. It says, but when the rulers saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. He probably didn't say it like that, but uh, quite a comeback to send that message back to those who delivered that nasty message to him. In verse 13, it goes on to say, then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Or we might say those who know they are broken, who know that they cannot fix themselves, who know that no earthly doctor can heal the wounds in their heart. I love this invitation and this invitation is to us all. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And I conclude with this. And may we contemplate the meaning of this scripture because Jesus today is still standing at the door for those who have not opened it. And I would encourage you to reconsider. The God we worship and serve is not a God of force. He's a gentleman. He's kind. He will never, ever force, unlike his enemy. His enemy's all about mandates, coercion, force, sanctions, you name it. So here it is. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. In the Middle Eastern culture, that's one of the most intimate things that you can do with someone is to go into their home and to eat with them. So please say yes to Jesus.